everyone, including the demigods, the demons, and the human beings, desired her. They were attracted because she is the source of all happiness. Purport. Who in this world does not want to possess wealth, beauty, and the social respectability that come from these opulences? People generally desire material enjoyment, material opulence, and the association of aristocratic family members. Bogaishvara Prasatta. Material enjoyment entails money, beauty, and the reputation they bring, which can all be achieved by the mercy of the goddess of fortune. The goddess of fortune, however, never remains alone. As indicated in the previous verse by the word Bhagavad Para, she is the property of the Supreme Personality Godhead and is enjoyable only by him. If one wants the favor of the goddess of fortune, Mother Lakshmi, because she is by nature of Bhagavad Para, one must keep her with Narayan. The devotees who always engage in the service of Narayan Narayana, Prayana, can easily achieve the favor of the goddess of fortune without a doubt. But materialists who try to get the favor of the goddess of fortune only to possess her for personal enjoyment are frustrated. Theirs is not a good policy. The celebrated demon Ravana, for example, wanted to deprive Ramachandra of luxury, Sita, and thus be victorious. But the result was just the opposite. Sita, of course, was taken by force by Lord Ramachandra, and Ravana and his entire material empire were vanquished. The goddess of fortune is desirable for everyone, including human beings. But one should understand that the goddess of fortune is the exclusive property of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One cannot achieve the mercy of the goddess of fortune unless one prays both to her and to the supreme enjoyer, the personality of God. You can see so much 
of your life is bound up with money. Do I have enough for now? Do I have enough for the future? Do I make mistakes in the past? This goes on and on and on. It is not that prosperity is unknown to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It's just that Bhagavatam is presenting a different path to prosperity. Indeed, the only viable path to prosperity. As you heard in yesterday's purport, the first prerequisite for peace is that all the wealth presented by Sri, the goddess of fortune, be offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Everyone should give up this false proprietorship over worldly possessions and offer everything to Krishna. This is the teaching of the Krishna consciousness movement. Does that sound practical to you? Everyone should give up their false proprietorship over wealth and offer everything to Krishna. This is the teaching of the Krishna consciousness movement. What do you think? It's too much, right? Not really practical, right? But then I ask you, what is practical about the materialistic plans made with no regard for Krishna? Demonstrate the practicality of those plans. People today uh, are economically bewildered in terms of their leaders having no solution for lasting prosperity. They're pulling their hairs this way and that way. What to do about the increasing inequality of wealth? Should some be very rich and some not have anything at all? Or so what if someone else is rich and you have nothing? Who cares? It's tough on you. <laughs> this just goes on and on and on. You can see that there is no practical solution to the problem of wealth and prosperity. Who gets it? Who should have it? Who shouldn't have it? The debates just go on and on and on. So why not? Listen to a solution that is outside the box. Apparently. Of course, the Bhagavatam solution is the box. But uh, ignorant as we are in Kali Yuga, we think that the Bhagavatam is very super fantastic. I mean, just think, you're hearing about the churning of the milk ocean. And out of that milk ocean is coming all these substances and all these personalities. Just think of Srila Prabhupada translating this. He knows it's fact. <laughs> but he also knows so, even so many of his own followers uh, will have difficulty accepting this as factual. Mm, the churning of the milk ocean. Uh, <laughs> out comes the goddess of fortune. Before that, poison was there, and then Lord Shiva drank it all. Just think. How the self-realized soul sees all that as factual and yet at the same time knows that because of the tiny sense perception of coming into their residence, they're going to have doubts. They're going to try how to evade the impact. Or let's just accept the essence of this story. Let's take some instruction from it, but there's no need for us to consider that it's factual. With our tiny senses, how do we know it is factual or not? As I often explain, 99% of the people say can't even understand the economic system they're operating in, or the political system. Yet when they read Bhagavatam, they get a little edgy that, oh, this is too much. This is an extraordinary event, no doubt. The churning of the milk ocean. All the greatest personalities in the cosmos are there. Vishnu is there, Shiva has been there drinking poison. <laughs> his wife, Ramani, is pleased by his effort. She gave him permission to do it. Yes, you can drink. You can drink the poison. And she was pleased by the result. You've heard of how out of the ocean of milk has come a Sarabi cow. And then there came a beautiful white horse, which which tried to show up. A horse so beautiful that naturally you think only the demigods should possess this horse. But you heard how Indra held back. Usually Indra can get kind of greedy and lusty. 
but he held back. He didn't grab for the horse because he had been warned by the personality of Godhead. Don't take this horse. Why was there reason for that? Vishnath Chakrani Tagore explains that the Supreme Personality of Godhead didn't want him to take the horse. He wanted the demons to take the horse, as indeed what happened. Bali Maharaj took the horse to the demons. So that was the plan of Vishnu, so the demons would get very proud. Oh, just see what we have. <laughs> There's a lot going on that is not immediately detectable by ordinary vision. And then, Lashmi Devi comes out of the ocean and look, and she's distributing opulence everywhere. The demons, however, are going to be frustrated. We don't get the blessings of opulence. Just by the glance of Lakshmi Devi, prosperity is spreading everywhere. But the demons felt completely left out. You'll hear that. Not only did they feel left out, but they became depressed. They became frustrated. They became bewildered. So there's something for everyone in material existence. Krishna fulfills all desires through his good avatars, through the demigods, through his agents. Even the material desires are fulfilled according to your karma. So when the demons are frustrated, sad, bewildered, we don't get the blessings of Lakshmi Devi. What came next? Varuni, the goddess of drunkenness. <laughs> The demons got her. Okay, we can get stoned and <laughs> everything will be all right. So you see, it's business as usual in the material world. When you're frustrated with material desires, you become intoxicated. So I often point out, how can the Western world, why just the Western world, even these days the Eastern world, how can you go on without intoxication? That is the only reward besides illicit sex for your hard labor. You take away the intoxication, and people have to face reality, which is very painful. How is it that a devotee can handle prosperity? It can only be done with the help of Krishna and Krishna's representative. With that kind of help, a devotee can handle prosperity and also poverty. And you see examples of both in the Bhagavatam, in Chaitanya Leela. It's not that bhakti is for the saintly kings only, like Prahlad Maharaj, Preju Maharaj, Ambarish Maharaj. No. Uh, sometimes Krishna will arrange that his dearest devotees are living in poverty stricken circumstances, just so that it can be seen by those interested in seeing that bhakti is beyond all material considerations. Sabai Pumsa Paro Dharma is all bhakti or devotee. Ahoy Tukhi. means no hatred, no material cause, no material circumstances or dependencies can stop bhakti. So sometimes Krishna wants his devotees to demonstrate that. In terms of wealth, the possession of vast wealth cannot impede bhakti, or the opposite, poverty cannot impede bhakti. You look at the case of Sudhana When he went to see Krishna in Dwarka, only because he was pushed by his wife, who was right. We're householders, we need at least a tiny bit to eat, we need a, at least a he cloths the wrap around us. We don't even have that. Uh, they were trembling with hunger, emaciated. Their little hut had holes and it was collapsing. Uh, but Sudhana Vipra, he was detached. So his wife kept trying to push him. Go see your old friend. Go see Krishna Dwarka. He's the friend of the Brahmanas. Sudhana Vipra's reply, well, I'm not a Brahmana, so... <laughs> I'm disqualified. I'm a Brahma Bandhu. He takes care of all devotees. Okay, fine. 
I'm not a devotee. I'm not surrendering. So, <laughs> no point in me going. And he was thinking, of course, why should I go see Krishna just to get material opulence? But his wife was very clever. She thought, look, I can understand, in other words, in other words to say, I can understand you don't want to approach and ask Krishna for anything. But all you have to do is go there and just stand there. And the Lord's associates, they'll see. <laughs> and they'll give you something. very fun. <laughs> Finally, Sadama left for Dwarka with his own motivation in regard to this economic crisis. You see, both he and his wife were right. <laughs> she was right. Where her house says we need a little something, at least one cloth that doesn't have holes in it. <laughs> we, we need a little rice so that she stops shivering from hunger because she's giving whatever tiny bit of food to add to her husband. Uh, she's right. And Sudama's right. I don't want to ask her stuff for anything material. So he decided, I'll just go, taking advantage of her request. I'll, I'll just go to see Krishna, that's all. <laughs> And that way, I'll, I'll satisfy her, and I won't betray my principles of not asking for anything material. So you know what happened when he got to Dwarka and how Krishna treated him. And the Acharya is explaining that Krishna was thinking, how did my devotee fall into such poverty? Krishna himself was wondering. Apparently, he didn't give Sudama anything. Sudama left the next morning to go back to his hollow, his wrecked little hut. And he was just as materially penniless as he was before. What would you have done in that situation? You would have been angry. I've done five years of emotional service. I've got Krishna's not taking care of me. I haven't gotten this. I haven't gotten that. I even got the darshan of Krishna. And he still gave me nothing. What kind of spiritual path is this? That we have been resentful. How could Krishna let this happen to me? <laughs> we all feel that Krishna owes us something. That's the nature of being a conditioned devotee. Of course, we should take care of devotees. But at the same time, uh, a real devotee doesn't place demands on the Supreme Personality Godhead. We take our situation as the result of our own karma and that we should be in a worse, a much worse situation. So just put yourself in Sudama's shoes. You, you're leaving the palace of Dorka, the palace occupied by Krishna's chief wife, Rukmini. And you're going away with nothing. Of course, Sudama got such intimate treatment from Krishna. Krishna sat him on the bedside of Rukmini and worshipped him. Uh, Krishna snatched the cheap, hard rice that Sudama had brought as a gift, but didn't want to give it. But still, in terms of material wealth, remember, we've got to follow the money line, follow the money trail. That Money trail in Sudama Vipra's life led nowhere to the same place as when he started out for Dwarka. So then, what is Sudama's mindset as he's going home with nothing on the money trail? Nothing in the bank. No donation. Zero. Of course, there are so many spiritual opulences. But like, we don't want to talk too much emphasis on spiritual opulences doesn't pay the bills, right? <laughs> but he's walking home as penniless as he was before. And what is he thinking? What's his mindset? How wonderful this is. How glorious Krishna is. He didn't give me a penny. <laughs> How great is that? How great is he? He knows that if he had given me just a little bit of wealth, I'd fall down. <laughs> oh, wonderful, my Lord. He didn't give it to me. This is so wonderful. This is so great. 
ไม่ได้เป็นแรง You might think you know you're you're following the wrong path, you're the wrong association. How wonderful Christian is! He didn't give me anything. He knows where I'm at. And what does Christian think? Back in New York, Christian thinking. I couldn't give him anything because I don't have enough for reciprocating with his body. Even if I give him the opulence of Indra, it's not enough. I'm embarrassed. Let's see how personal everything is between Krishna and the devotee. You would never think that Krishna is thinking like that. You probably would think Krishna is too—he's really too busy to deal with Sudama's issues and circumstances. Or Krishna's got too many parts and parcels; <laughs> he can't keep up with all of them. <laughs> Or he's too busy with Rukmini and the other 16,007 wives in Dwarka. But no, Krishna's thinking like that. His bhakti is so overwhelming. He gave me that handful of cheap, hard rice, but it was so delicious. I have nothing to reciprocate for his devotion. That's what Krishna is thinking. Not about the quality, the material quality of the rice, but about the bhakti of the offering. And that bhakti was so attractive that even though Sudama didn't want to give Krishna the gift that his wife had prepared of the cheapest quality. Materially speaking, even though he didn't want to give it, Krishna snatched it from him, showing you that Krishna accepts devotion. He loves the devotion of his devotee. So Krishna is thinking, I can't reciprocate it. I'm embarrassed. Therefore, I couldn't give him anything face to face. I don't have enough. The example the acharyas give is like the farmer offers prayers to get rain. And the rain feels embarrassed. This farmer is offering such devoted prayers. I can't reciprocate. Therefore, let me rain at night while the farmer is sleeping. I, I, I can't reciprocate enough. Uh, I have to do it. I have to send the rain in a clandestine way. Uh, so similarly, Krishna is thinking, I, I can't reciprocate with him face to face. I don't have enough for his body. But when he gets home. He's going to see a surprise, <laughs> and indeed, when s i d a r t h forgot him, uh, he couldn't even recognize his own r e s t l e s s It had been transformed into something beyond a palace in the heavenly lands, and his wife was an extraordinarily beautiful young lady. So the irony is, s u d a r t h who was so austere and renounced, now has to live in unparalleled o g a n This is Krishna's sense of humor. <laughs> you might think, "Ah, oh, he's got a really good deal," <laughs> because we're looking at it from the viewpoint of someone who's attached to wealth, prosperity, luxury, social respectability. So we're thinking, "Good on you, Siddhartha. You, you've got it all. But don't worry about anything else." But the irony is that. s u d a m a is actually attached to being renounced and not and super austere. So it's kind of like an ironic, <laughs> we don't call it a joke, but it's an ironic twist that has happened to the one who is so attached to being austere and having nothing now has everything and he's got to live with it. <laughs> so you might say, well, uh, I could go for that deal. <laughs> I figured out how to live with it. Would you? <laughs> Would you be able to handle it? We look around the world. We see that the places that are materially nice, with the good weather, the beaches, the balmy breezes, those are the most difficult places for devotees. To become and remain serious in bhakti, I've seen this all over the world. Uh, yes, Southern California is nice, but there are even nicer places. <laughs> <laughs> I have a ranking. I don't know if I told you. Of course, we have 
many serious devotees in Southern California, but also there are many who mm, have had difficulty in bhakti, and also many don't come to bhakti because, after all, Southern California seems for the moment to be sort of materially nice. That's number four. Number three, the East Coast of Australia, the Gold Coast, the name, town with names like Surfer's Paradise, <laughs> the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> I'd say it's Southern California tripled in terms of uh, attract, material attractiveness. Uh, it's very difficult for devotees to last there. Number two, Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> The Brazilian devotees say, if you can remain a Brahmacharya region, Rio de Janeiro for five years, you're ready to take some now. <laughs> and number one, of course, Hawaii. As you know, Prabhupada said, if there's any place in this world that's on earth that's heaven, it's Hawaii. So difficult to remain Krishna conscious there. Is prosperity actually our friend? Or is bhakti our friend? This is what the Bhagavatam, this is the point that the Bhagavatam is making. But let's look at, at California, since we're all in Southern California especially. I'll tell you some interesting facts that now Toyota is moving their North American headquarters from Torrance, California to Texas, outside of Dallas. You know, tax reasons and all sorts of things like that. But there's also another reason. They can't get any young talent. They can't attract young talent to their headquarters because young people can't afford California. And when they're just starting out in business, they can't end it. So Toyota's in a bind. They're thinking of succession. We've got an all-star team of older executives, but we can't bring any young talent in because the startup wages and salaries can't handle California living and the California lifestyle. So if we want our succession to go on, we got to move. <laughs> but there's a problem with moving. They can attract more young people in Texas, but their present staff, what do you think they're thinking? You're not leaving California. <laughs> <laughs> so Toyota's offering them all kinds of inducement packages. You know, we'll increase your, your salary, we'll give you relocation packages, this or that. <laughs> they're trying to retain their old staff while being in a position to attract a new staff, but the old staff doesn't want to be California. <laughs> and the lesson is already there from Nissan. Nissan moved from California some years ago to Kentucky. And so then uh, they did a study of what happened after they moved. 30% of their staff just went back to California. So we're <laughs> Kentucky. We'll give up our job. We just gotta get back to California. <laughs> So you see, prosperity and comfort uh, play such an important role in everyone's life. Therefore, why shouldn't the Bhagavatam deal with it? So you have the example of Sudama Brahma, who was happy, I don't have anything. But because the Acharya explained he was a little too renounced, he was attached too much to Vairagya in of itself. Therefore, in a sense, Krishna embarrassed him, sort of. Okay, you love to be so austere? Take more wealth than in your hands. And then there are other examples. Prahlad Maharaj, Prithu Maharaj, who didn't want any material benedictions, but they had to live. In order to render service, they, they had to live in such opulence. It's very difficult for persons to understand the principle given by Narayana and Prabhupada Maharaj. Tasyayayato ayati taku. Someone who's a cubby, who's actually intelligent, never strives for anything that's available anywhere in the material universe. No earthly opulence and not even heavenly planets operates. Because all that will come to you automatically according to your past karma. 
and times like the conveyor belt that brings you your past karmic reactions. So why is it trying for it? When it's going to come to you automatically. So both Prahlad and Narakuni give the same easy way to understand this point. You don't pray for your distress, it comes anyway. Similarly, you don't have to pray or strive for your material prosperity. What you do, you're going to get. So half of that sounds that we sound like we get a similar. I don't strive for distress. You know, I still get distress. Okay, I can accept that. But I don't strive for my material happiness, and I still get what I'm due. Uh, logically, I can understand the point, but in terms of lifestyle, I can't accept it. Why? Because we're so ingrained. What's so ingrained in us is this motive, passion, idea that I strive for my wealth. I strive for my prosperity. I strive for my happiness. A lot of it is up to me. Yeah, some is due to my genetics, uh, how happy a disposition I have. But mostly, it's all up to me. Uh, some may be due to God, whoever he is, or however. But most of all, it's my endeavor, and I can't stop endeavoring. So this point, by Narayuni and Galat Maharaj, requires some deep thought. And that's what a Kavi is, a spiritual intellectual. How is it that time is going to bring me automatically all the material prosperity and material happiness that I do, I don't have to strive for? By thinking about this principle, given by Prahlad and Narayuni, you actually become peaceful. <clears throat> and then, when you're peaceful, you can start to analyze this false sense of proprietorship that causes us to neglect the principle of Bhagavad Pra, that Lakshmi Devi, the goddess of fortune, is the exclusive property of the Supreme Personality of God and exclusively meant to be enjoyed by Krishna. So you can't pry Lakshmi Devi away from Krishna. And as we were discussing in the beginning, if you look at the economic perplexities and complexities of the world today, you can see that after hundreds of years of uh, so-called modern economic expansion, they're still bewildered. It's just that while everyone is bewildered how to have lasting prosperity, some people are busy making a temporary profit. But nevertheless, uh, the bewilderment increases. Perhaps it is not so pie in the sky and fairy tale. The statement that everyone should give up false proprietorship over worldly possessions and offer everything to Krishna. But we need examples of how that is so. Our society of devotees is meant to demonstrate what is in the books. By reading the books, people become curious. Could this be so? Even uh, that I said that there's the churning of the milk ocean, a humble person, a fortunate person, will think, there's a lot that I don't know. Uh, could be that there's a milk ocean. And the way these purports are presented, uh, they're so, we say, magisterial, they're so authoritative. That's what I thought when I started reading this <laughs> as a non devotee. Well, this person's really convinced about all this stuff. <laughs> Who am I to say no? <laughs> Every sentence just uh, emanates conviction, realization, authoritativeness. Uh, what do I know? <laughs> and Krishna is in the heart of the readers. Uh, he makes the readers fortunate enough to understand Bhagavatam, especially when the reader has contact with devotees. And then, after contact with devotees, the reader can render some service and also hear Bhagavatam in association with the words. 
Then you see the so-called the magic in action. So let's not be intimidated by the otherworldliness of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srila Prabhupada put so much emphasis on the message of the Bhagavatam, the distribution of the Bhagavatam. We're not acting alone. We are carrying out the desires of the Supreme Personality of God, who is in everyone's heart. Are there any questions? First of all, any comments by our illustrious senior vice president? Any questions? Yes? <clears throat> Ms. Maharaj mentioned how in uh, nice places like Los Angeles or where the weather is very nice, uh, people have a hard time becoming Krishna conscious. But how is it that in our society, we find in these places as many devotees, whereas in other places in the United States where it's very cold, there's not so many devotees? <laughs> <laughs> Which places are many devotees? Uh, a lot, like, you know, we have a lot of devotees here in Los Angeles. Where are they from? Uh, different places around the world. Exactly. <laughs> they come attracted by the excellent management and the presence of senior vice like you. <laughs> <laughs> this is New York. It's, you know, it's always been a nicely managed place most of the time, and certainly now it's nicely managed and devotees. You know, what's the management of sense? You can't look. <laughs> <laughs> they want to be cared for. They want a good temple program. So they, they come here from all over the world. But if you count the numbers who are simply from Southern California, <laughs> and then they're, you want, you want to find out where the most devotees are outside of India? Go to Ukraine. <laughs> thousands upon thousands of devotees. <laughs> but it's places of material disaster. Material is crazy. You know, they shot down a passenger plane and killed 300 people. That's, that's, that's Ukraine. That's standard. It's, it's materially nuts. But spiritually, oh, the bhakti was so oh, intoxicated. The bhakti of those devotees there. But you never want to. <laughs> Any case, uh, those who stick seriously to the bhakti path, even in Southern California, they make spiritual connection because bhakti is beyond the chill circumstances. It's just a little tough for those who are not so serious. They get mowed down very easily. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, we were, you were mentioning names like Prahlad Maharaj and Sudan Mitra. Out of millions of people like that, millions, maybe one achieves that maturity of the understanding, surrender and everything. So you were saying practical reasons, not for practical point of view. Can we, uh, we have seen that. I think for 35 years, people coming here, after five years, maybe 10 years, they go back and get jobs. And uh, so the practical reason, do we, do, do we as a leader in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness carry a responsibility for providing for those people who want Krishna, but at the same time they get caught up as hiding jobs, uh, in the, the, the practical reason would be probably Bharanus uh, Nandaran, but encouraging more. Can you speak something about that? Well, if you want to go down that road through Parampara, you have to consider that Prabhupada's vision for dealing with that was a farm community. Who wants to live on a farm? You know what farms do? Isn't it much better to be a slave at an office in the IC world 
And there's so much pressure that your mind's about to split, your know, brains are in shrivels, and you're in constant anxiety about whether you're going to be downsized, and the competitiveness and the stress and the strains. We think that's much better. So if you want to look at your question through the lens of Prabhupada, then you see that Prabhupada did think about that. But his solution was something that maybe we're all a little reluctant to various degrees to embrace. Why do you want to live on a farm when you can live in Southern California? Of course, you got a farm in Southern California also then. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, my point is that was Prabhupada's vision for how to engage so many people who otherwise uh, aren't strong enough to live the strict life of terms. So you have to decide for yourself whether that vision has any um, practical significance in this day and age. So Maharaj, the, the, the phrase that we use, simple living, high, simple living, higher thinking, is applicable only to a very small, tiny group. Because as far as preaching goes, if we mention the word for people who live in the city, it sounds very practical. You can live simply in the city. Even the non-devotees know that. There's so many online courses of how to live simply in the city. Did you know that? There's a whole simplicity movement amongst non-devotees in regarding the environmental crisis, in regarding people becoming so stressed and depressed. I've seen it myself. There are books about it, how to live simply in the city. You can live a simple life. There's simplicity.com or something like that. <laughs> it's like you're going on. And here we are saying, oh, no, we don't know if anyone will be attracted to our message. Here's one last point. If you want to be effective in your outreach, just forget about the 60s. <laughs> it didn't happen. Because by becoming so caught up in what happened in the 60s, we're not looking at what's going on today and the right market that exists today. We're still, to some degree, caught up in the, in the, in the throes of countercultural movement that faded decades ago. So much so that we're not looking at the extraordinary opportunities available today. So yes, there are people who are thinking about simplicity very deeply. I know what, the top environmental leader in North America, he has come up with a solution. How to keep people happy when they're living in rural areas? Because he realized, if people move back to the rural areas, what will be their entertainment? What will be their, their diversion? So he said, what's the solution? The internet. <laughs> They'll be able to tune into the internet even in the most remote areas, and that will keep them in mind. And of course, you know, the internet is mostly trash. 80% of all internet usage is pornography. In other words, he's got no solution. Back we go to spiritual solutions for material situations. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.